For our first California Chemco the Americas, I thought a terrific topic for an in-depth interview is state regulations. Therefore, I'm pleased to have in our studio to paint for us the plural perspectives of state regulations, Meredith Williams, Director of the California Department of Toxic Substances Control, DTSC, and Christopher Finarelli, Director of State Government Relations and Public Policy for the Western Region of the Household Commercial Products Association, HCPA. Meredith, California and revolutionary regulations are close as two coats of paint. It all started in the early 70s with the Hazardous Waste Control Act. Can you tell us about the evolution of DTSC and the lessons learned after five decades of Toxic Substance Control Act? Well, as you say, the, the national laws, the federal laws, really began or were inspired by what happened in California. And since that time, DTSC has grown as a department, but there's been some constants. Our commitment to protecting people in the environment has been unwavering. However, many programs have grown over the time. We're a much bigger department, uh, and we've, we have continued to be in that leadership role, and most notably with our Safer Consumer Products program, as you well know. But what we've done, what we've learned, and what we've seen as we've evolved is there are some key components that have to be there as we regulate. We need to continue to be transparent and support transparency. We need to take our roles as a regulator very seriously and keep ourselves accountable and keep the re regulated community accountable. And we count on engagement throughout that process um, and transparency from our stakeholders, really bringing a lot of people into the process in, under the tent. And that's really helped us become a stronger regulator, whether we're regulating from past contamination, currently used hazardous waste materials, or in the case of safer consumer products, chemicals in products now. Meredith, in 2013, you and your team implemented the Saver Consumer Products Program, aiming to reduce toxic chemicals in consumer products. Can you sketch the process for regulating products under this California SCP? It's a four-step process that are laid out by the regulations. The regulations, again, were, were developed with a lot of stakeholder input. The first step is to figure out what chem chemicals could be of concern. We have a candidate chemicals list, and that's the list of chemicals we choose from. That list is made up of a list of lists from other authoritative bodies around the world, whether that's California's own OEHA Proposition 65 list, or whether it's IARC's list, or some of the, lips, the lists out of Europe there are many lists that we refer to. So that's the set of chemicals that we care about. And then we associate those chemicals with individual products and assess the potential for harm and whether or not the chemical in the product could expose people and create some, some concern. If there is concern, we then move to the third step, which is to identify that product chemical combination as a priority product which triggers the, the full third step, which falls back on the manufacturer. The manufacturer then has to look for a safer alternative. They have to be very comprehensive in looking at, for that alternative, think of all the potential hazards, think across the life cycle of the product, and come back to us with a recommendation. We use that recommendation to implement our fourth step, which is our regulatory response. What can we do based on that alternatives analysis to make that product safer? Do we need to include more labeling? Do we need to restrict its sale? What else should we be doing? So those are the four steps of the regulations. You already mentioned there are many lists out there. Every three years, DTSC publishes a priority product work plan. How do you identify these priorities? Yeah, that's a great question. The work plan is really more of a policy document than it is a regulation. It really sets the framework for what it is we're going to look at over the coming years and just broad, identifies broad categories, not individual product chemical combinations. We may mention some products of interest. We may enter, mention some, some chemicals that are of concern, but by and large, it's a policy document and we make policy value decisions about what it is we're going to look at who we're trying to protect, where our interests are. So for instance, in the current work plan, we, are, we made a priority of protecting sensitive subpopulations, children, child, women of childbearing age, and we're very 
very keen to protect aquatic resources. So that has governed our current priority product work plan. We'll be moving into a new work plan in the coming year. Okay. Uh, Christopher, um, once a product is on the priority list, what are the key requirements for business then to comply with these regulations? Well, one of the first things you want to do is notify DTSC that you have a product in commerce. Um, now, that's a little bit ahead of the game from when HCPA gets, gets involved. One of the benefits from, uh, that HCPA brings to this is we educate the industry on what the department is looking at. So when we go back to that work plan, um, which is a multi-year process, um, we're educating and notifying and, um, uh, and announcing to our members um, what the department might be looking at. And by the time it gets to the point um, that we're talking about now, companies generally have a good idea of whether or not their product's in scope and um, if they need to do that alternative assessment. Um, once they do that alternative assessment, that might involve um, a chemical replacement, it might involve some kind of uh, reformulation of the product, um, and it, it might involve um, pull, pulling the, the chemical um, completely. Um, it just sort of depends on, on what that assessment is, what the alternatives are, um, but that, that process um, um, comes you know, you know, years, years later after that, that rigorous um, process that DTSC puts together um, with that work, that work plan, which ACPA very much engages in. Um, uh, we provide a great deal of information. You know, these manufacturers have a lot of information and data points about these chemicals that are um, helpful to the evaluation of that process, and um, we, we are a conduit for that as well. Okay, thank you. Meredith, all the data provided by the industry uh, to evaluate that is a huge task for DTSC. Eh? Uh, from a European perspective, eh, DTSC is the California European Chemicals Agency, or more or less. Eh? You also have a data management system called SAVER. Are you evaluating the risk taken into account of all these alternatives? And are you also evaluating then socioeconomic aspects of it? So CalSafer is our repository for all of the information we gather through the Safer Consumer Products Program. And we, through that, we have information on all the chemicals, information that's been submitted by the manufacturers, and even information we've gathered through our information call-in authority. We do have the authority to ask manufacturers to provide us with information about chemicals and products, chemical usage, and we're starting to do that more and more. What does that mean? You're going to just directly go out to them and say, on this product, we need more information? That's exactly it. We've done that with nail salon products to try to understand where are the chemicals showing up. Uh, there are a number of other c cases where we need to understand the sector well enough to be able to take a meaningful action. So that's been part of our process. And again, we share that information on our CalSafer website. With respect to socioeconomic uh, considerations, that's really been part of our policy perspective that we've brought to bear. We've thought about things like whether or not different populations, subpopulations, are disproportionately impacted by product choices. So is it because they're buying at a dollar store with maybe not as much chemical ingredient management, or is it because they're African-American women trying to conform to standards of beauty and using hair straightening products that have some very problematic chemicals? So we do think about the socioeconomic factors when we make our policy decisions. Christopher, SCP is all about restricting certain chemicals in products. On federal level, there is a kind of positive approach with the Safer Choice label. A voluntary program established in the 90s and with a fresh lick of paint revamped two years ago. True? Sure. Um, you know, the Safer Choice program, which uh, we've been very supportive of um, a couple years ago, we led a large coalition of uh, stakeholders, NGOs, industry to um, reauthorize the program to um, uh, make sure that it's a tool in um, industry's tool belt. Um, sometimes you do need a top-down approach when it comes to reg regulations um, of chemicals, um, but in this case, you know, it's more of a carrot. Um, many of our companies look to third parties like Safer Choice uh, to differentiate themselves in the market. And so that's an important tool for moving um, the industry towards sustainable um, products. You know, you look at um, uh, recently, they've done some work uh, through this program with antimicrobials and identifying products that meet 
certain specific standards as it relates to the environment, human health, um, product integrity, and, um, it, and it, this, this allows consumers to make um, smart choices about um, when they're uh, looking at products on the market. And then it's a real pictogram or something, the safer choice label, that people recognize in the market. Correct. You meet those certain standards, um, then the you know, e EPA will allow you to apply this uh, to, to your product um, so that, again, consumers know um, that this particular product is meeting EPA standards as it meets um, these certain criteria. Uh, EPA, then we are at the federal level. Uh, when should we look to states for action and when should we look into federal governments for chemicals management? Uh, does one drive the other? Well, I think it's both, to be honest. Um, in one sense, if there's an absence of activity at the federal level, then you're going to have that vacuum created and the states are going to fill in. Um, that might be because the US EPA is under-resourced under and aren't able to meet the needs um, that um, there's, they are uh, charged with doing by, the, by Congress. Um, we've, we've at HCPA been very supportive of um, US EPA receiving more resources so they, they can do those, um, those things. Um, it might be the lack of activity through Congress as well, um, but that inactivity can lead to either distrust or just a, that, that vacuum where the state's, state leaders are stepping in saying we need to do something about a certain issue. Um, at the same time, um, you do see state activity where one state, maybe it's California, maybe it's Washington state, maybe it's elsewhere, um, but then you see multiple states um, starting to take action on a particular issue. And then there might be a patchwork of um, regulations across the country, and that drives federal action uh, to um, uh, you know, put something together that, that, that um, has cohesiveness across the country. You know, an example of that might be um, microbeads and cosmetics that started you know, at, a, at a state level activity, and now we have federal action on that. Okay, you want to add something to that? Certainly, I think that's a, a great summary of the landscape and there is an interplay between the federal and the state. For instance, if we look at methylene chloride, uh, US EPA did a lot of work around that but hadn't really moved the ball. California picked it up as a priority product, the methylene chloride and paint strippers. And we, I think we carried the ball quite a ways and now EPA is kind of returned to that and taking more aggressive steps. But I think it's very important we all know the limitations that Tosca has had over the years. It's, it's in much better shape now, but as a result, states really didn't feel like they had a choice but to step in and take action. And so we do work hard to cooperate with our state partners, stay in communication, harmonize whenever we see an opportunity to do that. And of course, we have a great partnership with US EPA. California has a memorandum of understanding that allows us to share information. You know, it's a big landscape. We don't need to be stepping on our, our ch each other's toes. Unfortunately, there's plenty of work to do in terms of protecting people from chemicals. So it's a good idea to make sure that we're making a difference if we're going to take action and not being redundant with other efforts at the federal level. Uh, on both federal and state level, you also do risk evaluations. Are you also combining forces there, or is it either or? I'm glad you asked that question. I want to talk about safer consumer products. It's actually not a risk-based program. It is a program that's very much based on the precautionary principle, and therefore it's not the traditional risk assessment of, you know, 10 to the minus 6 risk of cancer. It's really about the potential for harm, the potential for exposure. And as a result, it gives us a little more latitude than when we are operating in that strictly risk, risk assessment framework. So I wanted to highlight that. Of course, there are other regulations in California that are much more um, traditionally risk-based. Uh, let's zoom out a little bit out of California. Christopher, um, can you paint with a broad brush what other states are very proactive and what their focus is? Well, you actually see a lot of themes coming out across the states. Um, you know, Washington, Illinois, Connecticut, New York, uh, Colorado, Hawaii. Um, you, there you're seeing a lot of activity around PFAS. You're seeing a lot of activity around extended producer responsibility related to packaging management. Um, um, we, we represent uh, the consumer side of the pest management 
uh, industry, and uh, a trend in, in that space is around um, the class of chemicals called neonicotinoids. We see these in multiple states, and so um, some of that, you know, comes from um, activity in one state like California, and then others, um, you know, add, add, add their own set of regulations um, to mirror that. Um, and other times it's a more organic process where you have you know, constituents um, or NGOs or others who are um, um, pushing, driving for those, those, those changes. But definitely seeing some, um, at a state level, definitely seeing some trends um, in those spaces. Is it like sports? Are they competing to be the first with a new regulation sometimes? <laughs> yeah, there might be a little bit of that going on. Um, and, you know, the cliche that California leads the rest of the nation when it, when it does these things um, is, is a cliche for a reason. Uh, but it is also the largest market, largest economy in the nation, and so there's a reason for that. Um, one emerging thing that's coming out of California right now is related to micro microplastics and the regulation of intentionally added microplastics in products, which candidly is a small percentage of the microplastics pollution, but, um, but California is taking action on that in part compelled by what activity is going on in Europe. So it can even go beyond that, right? Um, global activity can um, compel um, state activity and then from there you know, expand and then maybe at some point the federal activity that we were talking about before. Okay, let's return to a California classic, Prop 65. What are uh, its main objectives and how does it regulate the use of chemicals in consumer products? Well, Prop Proposition 65 is well known by um, a lot of people around the world and around the country. It's really about looking at chemicals and it's very focused on just chemicals, not necessarily chemicals in products specifically, but uh, it's looking at reproductive health, cancer causing, um, developmental tox toxicity, and identifying chemicals for which those are potential causes of harm. And should a product be contain, can contain those chemicals or should they be used in, in an environment, in a setting, it's a right to know. It's a right to know regulation that really requires that people tell people what chemicals, maybe not the specific chemicals, but what potential harm could come from the chemicals that they're being exposed to. So that was the intention of Prop 65. It's turned out to serve some very interesting purposes. First of all, it's been the foundation for other regulation, whether that's uh, regulation that DTSC is responsible for, like lead and jewelry, or some other toxics and chemicals, toxics and products laws. We have the authority, but the decisions to, to take action were based on Proposition 65. Also, we find the transparency has had value in terms of um, lists that are used elsewhere. We can refer to the Prop 65 list and it, it has value all, again, for other regulatory agencies to decide what, whether or not to take action. So Prop 65 has had a lot of value. There was a, an interesting paper, I will say, uh, that was published in 2020 by Polsky and Schwartzman that really laid out all the, the less visible benefits of Prop 65. And it's really much more influential and impactful than I think people realize. Okay. Hey, among others, Prop 65 states, no person in the course of doing business shall knowingly and intentionally expose anyone to those chemicals without first giving a clear and reasonable warning. But what is a reasonable warning? I mean, nowadays it seems like a cautionary landscape leading to warning fatigue. Christopher, can you paint the devil on this wall? Sure, so if you're gonna apply uh, a label to your product, you need to meet what's called a safe harbor level um, that's established by the state. If you don't meet that level, then you don't need to apply um, the label to your product. Um, it, one of the issues that arises out of Prop 65 is that anyone can file a lawsuit uh, uh, against a company, and, and as a result, you see hundreds of lawsuits um, every single year related to Prop 65. Most of them are settled outside of court. Um, there are very few where there's a decision made by a judge. Um, part of the reason is, is that all the, all the science and chemistry around whether or not you meet that level is very expensive to do before a judge. So many companies decide just to settle out of court. And, and in some cases, many just decide, well, I'm just gonna put a label on so I can avoid that. 
Um, and that's one of the reasons you see the prevalence of Prop 65 labels. You know, when I first moved to Sacramento, my uh, first apartment had a Prop 65 label outside of it. Um, sometimes you see it in, in, in places you might not expect, and certainly people even see it outside of California because the label goes on a product, it's sold across the country. So um, one of the concerns there is that if there is fatigue, it may be counter to what the intent of the law is, which is, I see this all the time, and therefore it may not mean as much to me anymore. Um, and what you're trying to do, because the intent behind Prop 65 is very important, which is educating consumers and the public on uh, potential exposure to uh, carcinogenic chemicals. And that's, that's, that's the goal. Um, and there, there are some, some challenges with attaining that goal in the way it's currently set up. If I can add, although a lot of companies decide to eliminate their risk by slapping a label on a product, other companies make the choice that actually is a, a great choice, which is just to reformulate away from the chemical so they don't even have to worry about the, the label at all. So I think that's a very much va value of Prop 65 and probably the biggest impact it's had. The other thing I'll say is that under Prop 65, they are evolving the labels. There's a recognition that the, the labels need to tell more. They're, they need to point people to the web to find more information out about what these chemicals are and how they might harm a person. When I made a road trip last summer, I, every motel, hotel I entered had the sign uh, that there are plastics used in the hotel. Why don't they replace it? Why make it recyclable in a way and then you don't have need for a sign? I think you shouldn't ask me that question. <laughs> I think you should ask the manufacturers. Obviously, the more we can move away from these chemicals, the more we can break the cycle of using toxic chemicals in products in our everyday life, the more we're going to benefit. And I have to say, well, you know, it'd be a great day for our department to be out of business and have fewer chemicals to regulate as they're transported and disposed of and f less need for hazardous waste landfills, et cetera. And I, and I would agree that it does provide that incentive structure to reformulate away. That's part of the, part of the intent. And um, companies are always looking way for ways to innovate, to provide consumers um, safer, sustainable products. And you know, part of that is coming from regulations and that incentive structure, and some of it is coming from um, consumers. Um, uh, you know, it, is, it is something that consumers are asking for, and, and, and many companies are, are looking to, um, uh, to, to respond to that. Christopher, um, politicians, but also voters in California, can influence that. That was a ballot initiative. Eh? Also, Prop 65 was like that. How can they influence these regulations to maybe change it for the good? Well, one of the challenges with Prop 65 in particular is that they can't to some degree um, because the way Prop 65 came about is that it was passed as a ballot initiative back in the 80s. And once you pass um, a restriction or a regulation or a rule or a law at the ballot, um, the only way to make significant changes to it, you can, you can tinker around the edges through the legislature, but to make significant changes to it, you have to go back to the ballot. And um, that's, that's an, an expensive exercise. Uh, you know, your audience is probably aware that California is a big place, and it costs about a million dollars to get a, a ballot on the, uh, to get initiative on the ballot. Um, and then many more millions to run a campaign about it. Um, that's, a, that's a high bar for, you know, for anybody. So um, that, 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 has, um, that has ended up in the result of, you know, Prop 65 has, has um, been a very rigid um, uh, set of codes that um, we have, we have um, on, the, on the books. One of the other challenges with the initiative process is you know, you run a bill through the legislature, it goes through committees, it has stakeholders, you go through amendments, there's changes in responses to different parties, um, and hopefully you come out with a 
a work product that best represents um, what, what uh, the state is looking for. Um, at the ballot initiative process, you don't have that. And so it's sort of an up or down vote on whether, whether or not uh, you want to keep it. So it, if you want to make changes to it, um, it's either challenging or it can be very expensive. So normally it's a compromise, but this is either this way or the other way. Yeah, and you know we live we live in a very uh, fluid, ever changing world, and um, the, the the ballot process um, is is not uh, not great at reacting to that fluid and, and, and ever changing world. Hey, there are many other initiatives eh, in relation to products throughout their life cycle, like the California Right to Know Act, uh, the California Extended Producer Responsibility Programs. What are their main objectives? Well, I, what I'll say about the Right to Know Act is that um, HCPA was five or six years now, I think, ago, um, uh, was a lead negotiator and ultimately a supporter of that. Um, and the idea behind that is very simple, that consumers should know what's going on, what's, go, what's going into the household cleaning products that they're purchasing. It was a great example of NGOs and industry coming together for um, a positive public policy product. Um, extended producer responsibility is a little bit um, newer. Um, it is, has been um, adopted in some states, including just recently in California. Um, we have about four other states where, where, we, where we've seen the program emerge. But effectively what that program does is it shifts the cost and to some degree the responsibility of the management of packaging for um, products um, and at the end of their life cycle. Uh, and um, you know we've we've been engaged on that issue in, in a number of states, including California. Okay, hey, we already mentioned over five decades of regulations. Um, how effective were they? And can you share some lessons learned and successes over those five decades? Well, I, I think there are a, a lot of successes, and we have learned a tremendous amount in terms of how we go about regulating chemicals. I will say that there are have been some, as I mentioned, some really hidden benefits of Prop 65, for instance. I do think that we've changed the conversation. There's a, a bigger commitment, a much wider commitment to the right to know, whether that's in industry, whether that's demanded by, cons by consumers, or whether it's in the legislature or the regulated agency, regulating agencies. There is that commitment in a way that, that wasn't there five years ago, and that's been a steady evolution. I do think that we have tools to take action against chemicals more quickly than we have in the past. It may still be the Safer Consumer Products Program, for instance, is a very thoughtful, intentional product where we try to avoid those unintended consequences and regrettable substitutes. And so that makes it a rather lengthy process. But when you compare that to the fact that under the original Tosca, we couldn't no chemicals were banned, um, and the challenges with that. It is a, a much greater improvement um, in terms of being able to actually take ac action against chemicals and products. And I do think that as a result, chem consumers are more aware. We societally are less willing to um, to uh, accept accept the status quo when it comes to how products are designed and formulated. So I think we have learned over the t course of time, again, I go back to these, these sim similar ideas, transparency and accountability. We have an obligation as a regulator to hold entities accountable to conforming to the law and to keeping uh, the public safe. We, we support and we nurture transparency whenever we can, whether that's by sharing information uh, that we gather as we do our work, or whether that's by sub, you know, supporting some of the things that are happening through the legislature with our expertise and what we've learned. So the transparency, I think, has a lot of, of value here. So I think it's been a, a, a tremendous um, evolution, and I don't think we're done. California continues to self-reflect. You see the legislator, legislature being very active, I think, as regulators. We're trying to understand how to best use the tools we can. One of the most important things I think we can do moving forward is be very mindful of the inter interagency dependencies and how to use these regulatory, our different regulatory authorities. 
And I think that's an important piece moving forward. Okay, Christopher, from your industry perspective, uh, what are the lessons learned and successes? Well, I think one of the lessons that I've seen, especially since um, being um, a part of this industry for the last couple of years, is how important it is to follow the science. We really value the work that departments like DTSC do for this reason. Um, and you know, you look at uh, pest management again, uh, pesticidal products, those go through a rigorous review at the federal level. Um, the EPA looks at hundreds of studies um, guided by a scientific panel, and if they don't like what they see, they will ask for more information. And then when you're done with that, you go through the states and you have a state like California with the Department of Pesticide Regulation, and they do an evaluation. A lot of it's the same data points, but it's a new set of eyes, um, new set of toxicologists, you know, different folks looking at it and, um, and, and making that, that uh, scientific, in this case, it, risk evaluation. Um, and that's really important, um, especially when um, we're, we, 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 the, the legislature does want to take a look at um, chemicals management from a legislative standpoint. You know, I, I've worked for elected officials. I fully recognize um, how they are, uh, they have an obligation to um, react to constituents and um, protect uh, their constituents. But um, the, the work that, that departments like DTSC and Department of Pesticide Regulation do um, is very, very important because the legislature is not set up for that kind of um, evaluation. Um, I have a high esteem for you know, the committee staff that um, are there in that building, um, but there were 2,700 bills introduced this past year. They certainly don't have the resources and the capacity to do that kind of scientific evaluation. And so having the, these kinds of um, departments that can do that um, is important to make sure we're making sound scientific decisions. Final question, what is the future of Prop 65 and SCP and how might it continue to evolve and shape chemical regulations in California and outside? Well, I won't just include safer consumer products in Prop 65. I'll throw in the Department of Pesticide Regulation, the Air Board, the Water Board, all of the authorities that California has, if I'm just talking about California. And the reason I say that is because I see much more interdependence and collaboration happening right now. For instance, if we look at what's happening in microplastics, Safer Consumer Products is interested. We see that Cal Recycle has an interest. Uh, the water board, of course, the aquatic impacts of microplastics are of great interest to the water board. And they might not have the right, right authority. They may turn to safer consumer products to see if they can help solve the problem. And I look at Europe and I look at how far along Europe is with the circular economy and thinking about the circular economy and how far behind the U.S. is. And I don't think we'll get there unless we take these integrative approaches. I think we have to be think about the life cycle, continue to do that, and we have to use all of our authorities as effectively as we can. Because if we're going to have a circular economy, we have to get the toxic chemicals out in order to be able to fully use those resources that are in our products. So I, again, my theme would be much more um, holistic approaches, collaboration, coordination. Christopher? Well, as I said, I just I would underscore that um, you know we we need to lean on these um, institutions that are able to have um, the scientific eye that DTSC and DPR and US EPA have, um, and 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 make sure they're um, they have the resources they need to do do the work that they do, um, so that we don't have that vacuum that's built up that I was talking about um, that might um, find itself in the legislature um, or. Or, um, or at the ballot where you're, you're now talking about um, chemicals management um, at a very, you know, to 40 million people and they're all voting on it and, uh, at the ballot initiative. So, um, you know, the, 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 the work that's being done at those departments and the stakeholder processes that they have put together so that everybody has a voice uh, is really important. Okay, Meredith and Christopher, thank you very much for sketching your plural perspectives on state regulation. A perspective is always limited by how much you know, and we learned a lot. Everyone wants to save the planet, and a great way to change the world is to change your perspective.